the general idea tonight is I will talk about a new book that came out this January. I don't know, looks backwards on my screen, but uh, seeing with the eye of Dhamma published by Shambhala. So that'll be the extent of the uh, overt sales pitch. I'd like to start um, while well, I'm thinking of calling this the blessings of translation practice. I'll be talking about the book's contents, but also a bit of the practice of translating and what a blessing it can be. Because I had been in the Peace, <clears throat> the Peace Corps in Thailand for about four and a half years before arriving at Suan Mok, which is Ajahn Buddha Das's monastery. He founded it with support from his family. And most things there happened in Thai. And I spoke decent enough Thai to have a pretty good understanding what was going on and being said. And that rapidly improved over the next few years. Um, Although I must say I was uh, editing an old translation a few years back and I was embarrassed by um, how much I hadn't quite got right. And so was the person who originally translated it. And we, we had a good laugh about um, our younger translator selves. And then after years of increasing familiarity, but even more so increasing practice. Because one can't translate this stuff just because one knows the two languages. There's the crucial ingredient with such works as of basically taking the stuff to heart and digesting it. When I first arrived, I had to translate for myself. Some monks, including Ajahn Buddha Dasa, could speak in English. But he was quite old, his health was poor, and I could learn much more from him looking, listening to the regular talks in Thai. And I could benefit others because dozens of non-Thais were coming through and few of them knew, knew Thai. In fact, I met Gil there, um, and I had the advantage of uh, knowing Thai. But we're American, so we could speak in English, of course. And so from the start, part of my practice has been translating. Um, and that works in multiple ways, translating for the sake of my own study and practice, also um, helping others. And then over time, 
this becoming a service I can offer to Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. I didn't always appreciate that. Sometimes it was hard work. There were certain people who were always trying to get me to translate something. And uh, some of it, I didn't want to translate. Everyone had their favorite book. Oh, you got to translate this one. <laughs> I did need some time to meditate, eat and bathe as well. So it could be annoying being seen primarily as a translation machine. But mostly, I received a lot of kindness and support. And again, something that took time to dawn on me, I was in my late 20s back then, that stepping into a need is Dhamma. Uh, one of the core meanings of Dhamma or Dharma is duty. Ajahn Buddhadasa emphasized this. And to step into the needs of circumstances, one's own needs, the needs of others, the needs of the community, that's Dhamma. And as I learned to relax and step into that, that brought satisfaction, which is something that still nurtures me uh, and was a big part of this book pro project. Also, my ability to translate which is not only knowing Thai, but having adequate linguistic skills in English. My undergrad degree was in creative writing, and I never made it as a novelist like I fantasized back then. But things I learned as a English major were helpful in this and that provided an opportunity for for a relationship that has guided my life ever since as i said there was a need and i showed up with certain skills curiosity interest bit of young American male arrogance, maybe more than a bit, kind of comes with the culture. Uh, and let's call that overconfidence. That allowed me to have regular interactions with Ajahn Buddhadasa which at his age was um, a special blessing. So being a translator has meant a lot to me over the years. And in various ways, it's still a big part of my life, whether translating from Thai to English or studying the Pali suttas and trying to convey what they say to people who struggle with reading the original teachings or for whatever reason are uninterested. Un But then the bigger translation for me is taking these teachings, whether the suttas or Ajahn Buddhadasa or others, and even 
even if reading in English, I mostly read suttas in English, my Pali's not very good. But the real translation is into practice. And as I touched on earlier, that's crucial for translating Dhamma books. Uh, I met someone a few years ago who was wanted me to produce a lot more. I'm a very slow, meticulous uh, translator and writer. And he was telling me of software that you can train on existing translations and then it will produce rough drafts, which I can then edit. I looked into that for about 45 minutes, <laughs> but it never grabbed me and um, probably never will. Because, and speaking especially for seeing with the eye of Dhamma, it was by the painstaking, slow, meticulous digesting of the manuscript, going through the Thai manuscript many, many times, going through the original translator's work and then polishing, editing, refining, retranslating, working mostly in two languages, occasionally a bit of, well, quite a bit of Pali terminology as well. And turning that into my own practice. I was fortunate in a way, or at least for me, COVID was a silver lining. I was um, just before COVID really hit here. Um, I was in Brazil. Uh, leading a retreat, doing other stuff, and at the time, finalizing agreements about my role with this book, which had shifted from just doing some polishing to doing a complete work over of the manuscript. And then I came home and early March, 2020. And for the first time in many years had a sustained period of time to work with a text. And fortunately I had one that was quite meaningful to me. In the past, because I travel a lot teaching or used to, uh, I would do this kind of work in chunks. And that for me was quite disruptive. Now, although I was doing some online retreats in 2020 into 2021, I had the um, benefit and it's weird because for many, COVID was, as you know, quite hard and disruptive. And for me, it was in certain ways, like financially. <laughs> for me, my wife and Kevala retreat, uh, it was pretty scary on that side. But on the Dhamma side, it opened up all this space. And so for weeks and months, over a year, I was working with this book and translating it into my own practice. 
I came to see the book as a contemplative journey. And that was based on my own experience of chapter by chapter. And as I said, I'm slow. Plus, there are things to do around our center, animals to take care of, chores, things like that. And each day working with the themes and teachings of Ajahn Buddhadasa's book. I'd like to share some of the highlights that were particularly meaningful for me. And if you've seen the book or are inspired to pick up a copy, you'll, you'll find these uh, highlights having a prominent place. One that really uh, got me was his repeated and extended exploration of datus. Datus is a Pali word in some ways similar in meaning to dhammas, phenomena, but it's usually translated elements. And in a, and it's a teaching I've struggled to fully um, take in. And I think that's because I grew up learning chemistry. <laughs> where the elements are in the periodic table. And, and plus, I grew up in a materialistic culture, capitalism all over the place, consumerism. And it, I've worked with the elements teaching four elements, six elements, gazillions of elements. For Ajahn Buddhadasa following the Buddha, everything's an element. But they're not elements in the periodic table. The way I finally got this was elements of experience. If we pay attention to physical experience, we'll find the elements of solidity and taking up space. I'm using Ajahn Buddha Das's explanations of earth element, cohesion, holding together, water element, temperature and combustion fire element, movement, including all change, wind element. And these require space element. And there's no awareness of them without consciousness element. These six are kind of the fundamental elements of experience. Feelings, an element of experience, perception, thought, greed, hatred, delusion, kindness, and compassion. All these are elements of experience. And if we practice with this teaching, which I enjoy doing, um, particularly in the chapters where I really needed to take this in and find words that conveyed Ajahn Buddhadasa's meaning and hopefully the Buddha's meaning, that if we start paying attention to 
elements of experience, we notice that they keep happening in combination with other elements. And if we keep watching the combinations, we'll notice how this keeps changing. I don't want to throw big uh, poly terms at you like impermanence or anicchata, because that's not the point. It was contemplating this. And I think Ajahn Buddhadasa was pretty good at not telling us what we're supposed to see, not giving us the answers, but saying, look, 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 which was his understanding of Vipassana. Looking is contemplation. If we keep looking, there's seeing, which is the meaning of Vipassana or insight. So that's for me a major highlight of the book. And one of the bonuses for me as translator, coming to terms with a teaching that I've uh, taught <laughs> to others, but feeling a much, much deeper connection. Right now, elements of experience, sound, visuals, recognitions, memories, words, and then words with meanings, elements combining, shifting, changing. And on one level, that's all life is, this ever-changing, combining and uh, uncombining of elements of experience. And I'm not talking about some external reality. I'm sure that's got its elements too, which kind of leads me to another highlight of the book, Worlds. Um, we like with uh, the elements of the periodic table, it seems most often if we speak of the world, we might mean the planet, we might mean um, society, and sometimes the Buddha seems to have used the word world as society, people in general, in his, in the area where he lived. But in a number of important ways, the worlds that we contemplate, and this is the contemplation I, I continue to work with, is the worlds of the senses. The Buddha spoke of various worlds of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, or if you prefer, heart. Some of these are heavens or paradises. Some of them are hells and places of torment. And there are direct quotes from the Buddha of these worlds arising with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind or awareness or consciousness. Worlds of memory, worlds of emotion, worlds of opinion. Some people are very curious about how the world formed, how many billion years ago was it? And the Big Bang, even more billions, the so-called universe. That's interesting stuff. 
but in Dhamma practice, the worlds that Ajahn Buddhadasa probably in line with the Buddha kept encouraging through in this book is to pay attention to the worlds of the senses. And again, there are some things he told us about what to see, but one of the primary ones is it's just so. <laughs> so instead of laying on the uh, official Buddhist line of what insights about, there's some of that because he's, he's uh, a loyal uh, Buddhist in many respects. But often he would use the word, uh, his translation of the Pali word, tatata, which is often translated thusness, just so, just like this, which actually says nothing. <laughs> it just says there's this. <laughs> and the rest is for consciousness, mind to pay attention with enough focus, calm, and clarity to see. I think this is brilliant stuff rather than telling us what to believe or programming ourselves to be good Buddhists. And much of his original audience, they had already picked up all these Buddhist teachings. And what he's trying to do in seeing with the eye of Dhamma is to see, use these, I would say, eyes, use these eyes of Dhamma to look and see. So whether it's looking in terms of elements of experience or looking at the worlds, watching the worlds of the senses, and um, I must say, I find this real helpful as I continue to be concerned about climate change, habitat destruction, ongoing wars in the world, wars that my own country has done uh, far too much to encourage or the, war, the wars the United States initiated. Of course, those were just wars, <laughs> unlike uh, the war in Ukraine. Those are things that don't sit well with me. And it's real easy to feel overwhelmed by all the, to put it simplistically, bad stuff going on in the world. And I have no interest in denying stuff like climate change or brutality in Ukraine, Yemen, or um, factory farms in rural Wisconsin, or California, but what we're actually experiencing are the worlds of the senses. And a lesson for me that was highlighted working on this book is that by being mindful of the worlds of the senses were in better shape to respond to the worlds out there. I hope that's coherent. Um, part of it is 
watching how worlds are created and how worlds pass away. It's going on constantly. And that may be true of galaxies way out wherever, uh, but it's totally true of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind or memory or imagination or thought right, right here. And again, the contemplation is to look, observe, watch, have enough focus or samadhi, which is another big theme in the book, to see clearly without bias, without opinions, without ideology, and so on. Another aspect of the book that I had lots of fun with is everything is samsara. For to go back in my own history with Buddhist teachings and practice, when I first heard often dogmatically about traditional notions of rebirth. They never appealed to me. And regrettably, I had a certain aversion to traditional rebirth teachings, whether in Theravada forms or Tibetan or Chinese or whatever. These were common in Thailand and around the Buddhist world. And so I got used to samsara as a way of talking about rebirth. And samsara in the popular understanding as I understood it back in the 80s and 90s was, oh, samsara is you're born, you die, you get born again, you die again. And it's just suffering and suffering for all, over and over again until you get enlightened and somehow escape from all that. In short, I had a certain bias certain uh, aversion, aversive bias, and tended to just disregard this teaching. But I couldn't disregard it when there was a major chapter in this book about sam samsara, at least half a chapter. And so I had to bite the bullet and digest this, which was healthy because aversion and biases regarding teachings, even if they turn out to be not what the Buddha actually said, although it's hard to prove <laughs> and we don't have to form opinions one way or the other, but at least on certain things where the evidence is murky. But the aversion, the bias, the opinionatedness, oh, don't worry about that stuff. That's not so healthy for practice, I feel. So I was kind of stuck. And as I worked on the sections about samsara, and due to time, I'll simplify. Ajahn Buddhadasa emphasized that samsara means spinning. Wandering might be a little more accurate, but the word that really got me was spinning. 
and then he's he's describing how everything is spinning and this is you know with datus combining discombining worlds being created passing away i i got into watching spinning which means cycles and patterns and going through days where sig significant periods of watching patterns all the patterns in me the patterns of sunrise sunset the phases of the moon the seasons if we pay attention everything is made of cycles the water cycle that we depend on for example um digestive cycles breath breathing in breathing out cycles and so i came to see samsara is all about recycling forget about rebirth <laughs> not my favorite uh belief but i i'm much more tolerant of it these days but recycling constant recycling ensure that that's what we do with our our plastic with little triangles on it and um glass bottles and stuff but it's all recycling and this this helped me i have certain lazy tendencies i'm not good at cleaning and there are things like that or flossing that actually i'm still not good at flossing but i'm better at cleaning now by seeing that these things like cleaning all the onerous chores are just keeping my living quarters in decent shape cooking food over and over doing dishes over and over some of those things i quite like like cooking making coffee and tea cleaning cat boxes sweeping the floor scrubbing toilets those aren't the ones i like but seeing them within cycles of basically life help me to relax and just okay <laughs> just participate in these cycles of life and this is part of ajahn buddha das's take on samsara as well as elements and everything else it's all nature and so instead of picking and choosing the stuff we like the stuff we don't like seeing it all as nature recycling and of course some awareness that that's happening with this body awareness it's happening right now as i'm recycling teachings that go back through various transmissions to the buddha i hope unless i've butchered things and these these just move and ripple and expand and change kind of running out of time so i'll wrap up with this highlight and seeing in the recycling the spinning there's an aspect to it that's just nature 
And then sometimes there's the perceiving part of it as me, and then the rest as other. And taking the me part as special or central, giving it weight and importance, sometimes in really messed up neurotic ways, sometimes in nice, creative, loving ways. But watching the natural samsaras, like the movement, I live in the, not quite in the woods, but next to the woods, a nice valley. It's easy to watch the sun and moon move through the sky, watching the trees respond to weather, squirrel, birds, things in the house, cats, um, interactions with my partner, and so on. There's the natural just life doing its thing. And then there's the particular samsaras of liking and disliking, craving and clinging, ego identification, and what follows from that. These are some samples of contemplations I got a lot out of and still do um, from this particular project. And signing on for a translation job of an important Dhamma book requires um, really practicing in these ways. And as well as doing standard sitting practice of various forms and incorporating elements and samsaras, noticing all the samsara that goes on in meditation, the um, natural sort, like breathing in and out, and the neurotic sort, the, or as Ajahn Buddhadasa emphasizes, the stuff we don't understand, the stuff we don't see clearly, that is the ignorant stuff. It's not ignorant, <laughs> but the not seeing clearly is where the ignorance is. Ignorance simply means not knowing, not understanding. People tend to take it as pejorative and somehow negative. It's just a description. Often there's not understanding. And so things get neurotic, messy, and there's suffering. By contemplating such things, we inevitably observe how suffering happens. It's not required to point out the suffering. If we pay attention to the elements of experience, the world of the senses, the rebirthing of all these cycles, patterns, opinions. Opinions are a particular kind of pattern, so are beliefs. If we pay attention to these, we'll also see suffering and how it happens. And then we find important clues to freedom from suffering which can't really be taught. It can be pointed to, talked about in certain ways, but really it's by contemplating all the stuff 
of life that it becomes possible to see freedom from samsara. Samsara continues, but there's freedom. Um, oh, and I should conclude by, I'll leave this one with out much explanation because it probably doesn't take much. Ajahn Buddhadasa also observes that practice is not complete without metta. Uh, it's fine to practice for our own well being and benefit. Practice is completed when metta, kindness, and karuna, compassion, blossom. There's a chapter of uh, the trees of the Dhamma life that we nurture. And the last tree is the tree of kindness. So um, I'll stop here with uh, some of my favorite highlights from seeing with the eye of Dhamma. And we've got 35 minutes for whatever you'd like to talk about. If there are questions, I'll respond. I may not have any answers. If you want to comment on something, I'll listen. And I guess we raise hands and then I call on you. Aaron, if I pronounce that correct. That's, that's it. Um, so Santi Caro, thank you for doing the translation of this, uh, this book. Uh, I've just started reading it, and um, um, I can't help but think that the title has something to do with stream entry. Could you make a comment? Uh, could you comment about that? Um, hmm. To be honest, that's not Ajahn Buddhadasa's title. His title was Little Dhamma Book, which you might have seen in the foreword. But there was agreement. I was the last one to sign on to this. But the editors and various people said, that's not going to work on bookshelves. So, um, we, because of the theme of co contemplative journey, we brainstormed and ended up with seeing with the eye of Dhamma. So in our thinking stream entry wasn't mentioned, but I think it's a reasonable guess on your part. It might not be too far off. I actually don't think in terms of stream entry so much myself. But stream entry, one traditional notion of it, which is maybe what you're thinking of, is to have that first real penetrating insight into what in the book is called non-fabrication or non-concocting. Traditionally, that's spoken of as Nibbana. When there's a clear enough vision of the end of suffering, life changes course. 
So I, I don't remember stream entry coming up at the time, but it's a reasonable thought. Thank you. Chris. Santi Carl, thanks so much. Um, I uh, was turned on to Buddha Dasa's work by uh, Larry Rosenberg and um, who else? Jack spoke of him, uh, Guy Armstrong, Gill. There's a number of teachers that spoke to him. And I, I read initially Hartwood many years ago and I just picked it up again a few hours ago to get prepped for this because I've been meaning to reread it. It finally made sense to me. <laughs> when I read it 10 years ago, I mean, I needed like another decade of practice to sort of get in alignment for it with it. Um, so thanks so much for the translation. I just wanted to um, also honor the Peace Corps. It seems as you, Jack Kornfeld, Joseph Goldstein, and uh, Ajahn Sumedho all were all entered that and practiced through the Peace Corps. So I don't know, honor JFK and the Peace Corps, I guess. Right now. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for your work. Thank you. Yeah, Peace Corps, um, my reasons for entering were somewhat muddled, but it opened up cool stuff. And I have lots of Thai friends if I ever have to leave the US. <laughs> I've got a place to go. And um, especially my understanding of Buddhism before Peace Corps was minimal. And so I'm very grateful for Thai culture, Thai society, and Thai Buddhism and Peace Corps. I wish Peace Corps had something near the budget of the Pentagon. Ali, hi. Hi, thank you so much, sir, for being here with us and sharing the words of wisdom. Uh, I was just wondering to get your opinion on the uh, habits that you had mentioned about the samsara, because I do have like these like mental habits that it's harder to uh, uh, overcome. It's been like ingrained for so long. And uh, also, especially during the pandemic, as you had uh, mentioned, I've created like some uh, physical things that I'll do the way I pour the tea at certain time or fix the, I mean, I've fallen into different pandemic created habit habits and uh, breaking those, would you say will make uh, the, the ones that are easier, like physical stuff uh, to be able to uh, access the mind, uh, hopefully habit, habitual patterns and thinking patterns. No, I don't. I, I was wondering if you could comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm less concerned by the physical habits. I think of some of them like I have my cooking oatmeal routine in the morning and I think of them as rituals. And unless I see them causing trouble I'm not so concerned, but the mental habits. Right. And for, for me, I'll stick with the themes of the book that I've mentioned, but to start to look, what are the elements that go into those habits? And the um i i'll mention the sensory worlds but especially i've i continue to find it helpful when i observe an opinion as um a pattern that's a step to disentangling my identity with it. Often, you, you 
on some level, if there's an opinion, it's my opinion. Some suttas, this is called standpoints or basis, that mind is grounding itself in something to try to feel security, solidity, control, and to relax and just see patterns. And the opinions all of us, maybe all of a sudden or gradually, they're not so solid. And if watching what goes into creating an opinion, or I found it helpful to ask, where did I get that opinion or that view? And in the Buddha, Gil's um, translation of the Book of Eights is great. And what's wonderful about that book is all the suttas on view. And nowhere does the Buddha say we should hold views. It's all about letting go of views. And so I'm using opinions or views, which is different than skillful perspectives. And then there are other thinking patterns, habitual planning, worry, self-deprecation, and so on. But how, how to loosen that ego identification is crucial. Right. And for me, using the word samsara as a mantra, and, and honestly spending major parts of many days watching cycles, and so an opinion comes up, it's another cycle. A worry comes up, another cycle. A tension between my wife and I, it's another samsara. But to call it that relaxed some of the me, it doesn't have to be my samsara, it's just samsara. <laughs> My wife and I are in a certain dance, me and each of the cats, we have our dance. And with each loosening, it's possible to see more clearly. Because if we've got some idea of, oh, I need to get rid of that. Sorry, that's an opinion. It might be conventionally correct, like, oh, that's destructive. You'd be better without it. But the drawback is it's your opinion. It might be another you, because we're all schizophrenic or multiple personality in that sense. And so just to have an opinion about other opinions or a worry about other worries, doesn't break the cycles. Seeing the cycles allows us to see through them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thought I saw a hand or a chat. Oh, Beth. Uh, found the comments about views and opinions absolutely wonderful. Well, that's gratifying. A few samsaras just happened there, pleasant ones. Thanks, Beth. Ron? You're muted. Uh, thank you for these very interesting teachings. I, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, I had a, a question uh, regarding your idea of uh, 
samsara as uh, being a, a recycling, uh, basically the way nature, evolution recycles, uh, you know, material, energy, that sort of thing. Uh, how is that connected with this Buddhist principle of dependent origination? Is, uh, for example, is, uh, is samsara seen as a manifestation of dependent origination or is, uh, is dependent origination somehow different than what you're describing? I, I would say it depends partly how you use the word dependent origination or I prefer dependent core rising. Um, Ajahn Buddha does has a book on that. That in our understanding, Paticca Samupada is the conditional processes that lead to suffering, that condition, support, underpin, foster, and maintain suffering. From that perspective, dependent core rising is a particular, describes these samsaras of suffering. Unlike what I call the natural samsaras, like the the water cycle or the circulation of blood in the body, the digestive processes, these need not be suffering. Mm -hmm. Depending core rising is a careful look at how through not understanding there's a particular energy, Ajahn Buddha Dasa called it the power of concocting that shapes how we experience life and react. Mm -hmm. and, and that reaction is based in clinging to self, which is unstable and basically neurotic. Well, would would um, would be would clinging clinging to self uh, that results in suffering um, is the clinging uh, an example of the uh, the conditions that you've contributed to um, to making the suffering come about. Conventionally, yeah, you, but but. But clinging is what makes it you. Because mm -hmm. it's not really you, it's just these natural elements combining. But we, the clinging, the core, the core meaning of clinging is clinging to the subject. Taking the subject of experience as me. And that gets then layered onto the sense of me, a separate. We can try to solidify our separateness, anger, and fear really exaggerate that separateness, make it worse make it more conflictive and so on. Thank you. Sorry about the you part. It's, uh, it's a pattern I've got. Just drop in one piece. Um, the penultimate chapter of the book is about Sankara and the Sankara concocting or fabricating and non concocting, non fabricating. 
And it's possible to conceive of these as separate or opposites, and in a way they are. But I want to end with a theme I've been mentioning. It's by watching the fabricating, the concocting, that there are glimpses of non-concocting. And then there's nobody to be liberated. There's nobody to get enlightened. Getting enlightened is samsara. <laughs>